Hi, I'm Sophie Pelsmakers and I'm back for part two as part of Aiming for a Sustainable Tomorrow invited by Safa. And this talk is about exemplary international housing design examples. As a reminder, in the first part, I covered some of the current state of housing design and in particular highlighted three key priorities, that of climate change impacts, that of lack of holistic design and the importance for it, specifically related to housing quality and quality of life, but also whether our buildings and the housing we design works in reality. Of course, there were many other priorities that I could not cover, but um, the three projects that I'm sharing here will address the above aspects, but also most of, um, or several other aspects as well that we couldn't cover in the, th in the key priorities in the first part. So, the first case study is by Rick Mather Architects and Archetype in London. It was completed in 2014 uh, to Passive House Standard. It's including both social and private housing, about 53 units, and also some commercial space and is built to lifetime homes and advanced accessible standards. So it means it can be adapted for an aging population or people in wheelchairs um, over time. And what's very interesting about this project is, is often when we think of low energy, low impact projects, um, we tend to think of a very compact form, particularly with passive house boxes that look alike often. But this project shows you that that does not have to be the case. And it's a quite complex site, so they had to come up with a quite complex form um, to ensure that it would be good daylighting, but also protection of views and privacy as well. And um, to quote Rick Mather, he says that what makes the project unique is how the standard is achieved given the form brought about by the highly specific response to the site, a very real achievement and demonstrates that Passive House is not restricted to factory architecture. Another interesting thing about this project is, is that um, it is um, closely done in collaboration between two architecture practices exactly to meet these high standards. Um, and to ensure that that complexity um, wasn't um, at the detriment of the high passive house standard, but equally that the high passive house standards wouldn't actually affect the high architectural quality of the project. And also the way archetype work is very close with engineers and cost consultants, clients and users, and also the architects also do their own energy model and can use it then iteratively as a design tool to immediately see what is the impact of certain design moves they make on the actual energy use in the passive house standard. And then they can play with this uh, in their design. There's also something interesting, um, maybe not so unusual in the UK, but we have often mesonets, so it's a two-story house that can sit uh, below apartments or that two-storey houses can sit above other two-storey houses as well. And this includes some of that typology as well. And then each of these houses have their own uh, private outdoor space as well. They've also, the architects have also shown real care about spaces between buildings, as you can see here in the courtyard. But unfortunately, despite their best efforts, they didn't actually get approval to um, have the building monitored about people's satisfaction or also how it performs in reality, which is something that particularly archetype architects always try to do on all of their non-domestic projects. Now, the next project managed to do a little bit of performance monitoring and also checking in with the, um, the tenants of the, the housing scheme. And this is by Levi Bernstein, Loudon Road. It was completed in 2013, about 42 new homes. It, majority is actually also social housing. Uh, it was built to passive house principles, but not certified to passive house standard. And there's also some solar panels on the very top of the building. And what's interesting is that the architects learned from other building monitoring that they undertook and that there was a real overheating risk in a low energy scheme. Um, and so they actually already at this stage allowed solar shading. So it's built to high fabric standards. It includes climate change mitigation and adaptation measures like the solar shading. And the architects, as I said, also monitor some of the units to understand how the design works in reality. And as you can see here in the specification, it's high fabric efficiency, more or less, to the uh, passive house standard. You can see here the numbers um, at the bottom. Um, it's also got high air tightness, it's including natural ventilation, particularly in summer that is needed. But of course, in winter, there's background ventilation with heat recovery. 
and it does have um, some solar thermal panels, as I said, but it also have actu has got actually uh, gas-fired central heating boilers, which of course means it's burning fossil fuels. They maximized uh, daylighting, uh, trying to achieve better than average daylight factors in each of the um, habitable spaces. And as I said, they also included um, solar shading from the very start, which you can see here for the west facade to cut the sun out. Um, and they also have some balconies that either set in and create shading or that actually um, uh, extrude out and then act as a shading uh, mechanism for the um, apartment below. As I said, the architects also managed to monitor some of the units in um, this project. They only entered into five dwellings, not all of them. This was done in 2015. And they monitored the heating energy use, the occupancy evaluation, they did a questionnaire. And then two dwellings had temperatures and relative humidity monitored in both winter and in three in summer. And some of the results indicated that actually it was still comfortably warm even in winter. And even in summer when it was 32 degrees Celsius in London, the living spaces were actually pretty comfortable and not too hot without cooling, suggesting that the solar shading was effective. And on this image here on the left, you can actually see some of that solar shading on the south, but also some of these setback balconies um, as well. And then some of these uh, west-facing uh, solar shading fins as well. And uh, the majority of the energy use was actually better than they predicted, and it was close to the passive house benchmark of those apartments that they monitored. And they found that the heating bills were four times lower than the UK average as well. And then the final case study that I wanted to talk about is One Brighton by Field & Click Bradley. Now before I uh, go into this case study in a little bit more detail, I want to perhaps highlight that um, I hope not too many of you are disappointed I did not include any very recent case studies, because also even One Brighton is actually uh, was built uh, between 11 and 13 years ago. And the reason why I've included uh, projects that have, uh, are a little bit older is several reasons. First of all, they have endured. They have shown that they're actually really appreciated and loved by their communities and that they work. Um, but also because um, at this stage, uh, it's taken so long for these projects to be monitored and for any issues to be fixed, that only quite recently have the lessons that we learned from these projects been shared. And that also means that while these have been built quite some time ago, actually the lessons we learned from them are still very recent um, and are still very relevant as well for other projects going forward. And I hope that as we uh, monitor more and more housing projects specifically and that we do this more as standard practice, that we can actually start to more quickly release some of that data and the results and fix some of these issues so that also um, we have enough information to present case studies in detail as well. So, um, as I said, One Brighton was designed by the architects Field & Click Bradley. It is in Brighton. Uh, it was designed according to the One, Living, One Planet Living principles. Um, and you can see that here on the left, uh, some of the criteria that it includes, and it's actually quite a holistic approach. So it's not just about carbon and energy and water, but it also includes sustainable transport, um, local and sustainable materials, food uh, growing as well, um, and also natural habitats, culture and heritage, and equi equity and fair trade, and also health and happiness. There's about 172 homes, it's a fairly large scheme, about 2,000 square meters of community and office space. It was um, designed and built to Eco Homes in Briam Excellent. They have a zero private parking with a car club, low impact construction, and as I said, it was actually commenced about 13 years ago and the first occupants moved in just over 10 years ago. This diagram uh, shows a cross section and where they really try to connect the design and the sustainability at different scales, where they try to connect, as you can see, your local transport with then the car club for the community in the building and then intermodal transport to national transport links as well. And they also try to connect some of the greenery from the side then actually at the vertical scale uh, through the building as well. And then they're showing how that, you know, the sun provides um, free heat, but also some active um, electrical heat as well and uh, also fresh air. 
Um, you can see that at the very top of the roof there is a micro wind turbine, but actually because they realized that other research was coming out, they actually changed that after planning, but I'll describe that uh, in a moment. So the concept was really designed uh, in a quite complex shape, and they did that again because it's a quite complex um, kind of corner site but also because it actually is very good for housing quality. So they created uh, slots between um, some of the units, which then created uh, extra views out for those units, but also gave extra daylighting as well. And it gives particularly these oblique, oblique uh, long views as well. And they also then create sky gardens in these spaces, as you can see here, and also some uh, raised planters in these sky gardens for uh, communal vegetable growing. And I think also architecturally creating some of these gaps and slots, as you can see here, breaks up a rather large narrow building mass, um, but also allows kind of use through and gives some interesting architectural um, qualities as well. So in summary, um, the thermal envelope is quite efficient. Um, but not as efficient as Passive House. It does have triple glazing, also mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. They have a wood fuel boiler that provides 100% renewable hot water and heating. They also have some electricity met via PVs, about 5%. And as I said, they changed that already after they had planning permission to place a micro wind turbine. Um, but they actually also have linked large wind turbines to the scheme that means that they can actually offset all of their carbon emissions uh, as such. There's also recycling that takes place. As I said before, they have a car club, including one electric car and 160 bike spaces. There's on-site food growing on the balconies. They also use their own on-site compost. They harvest rainwater. They have water efficient appliances. There's also permeable paving to allow the water to percolate through and it reduces flash flooding further in the city. And they also use non-toxic materials to safeguard occupant health, although the, 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 the structural frame is actually in concrete, but then the walls are infilled with clay block and wood fibre insulation. Now, then a few years later, um, over a period of three years with uh, university researchers, they went back and monitored the project and also surveyed the satisfaction of the residents. And I'll report a little bit on these results now. Um, and if you want to know more, by the way, you can find out more also in the book by Bill Gething, who was uh, one of the architects of this, a field and Click Bradley, Designed for Climate Change. But there's also Building and Performance Evaluation Report you can also gain access to as well. And you can see here the different partners involved. So they actually undertook fabric testing. So they did a co-heating test, also air tightness test, and they also measured the U-values of the walls and the other construction and did a thermographic survey and what they found was that actually the measured U value on average was actually of the walls was a little higher than expected and as a result also the overall heat loss was actually higher than expected. They did find though that the mechanical ventilation performed um, as designed as expected. They also spoke to the residents so this is a building use survey and it shows you the green dot here that actually the project is actually considered quite satisfactory by the residents um, compared to other uh, projects of this kind. But when I did speak to people, not everything was perfect. So residents particularly liked the layout, the allotments, the bike storage and the insulation, so they kept them warm. But what worked less well was they felt that there was an insufficient sound insulation, there was lack of car parking, also some issues with the intercom and the heating and ventilation system. And particularly related to the winter heating system, some of the people said it was not very reliable and they found it difficult to control the temperature. Um, but while then many more said that actually they had a positive comment or no issues or made no comment. But what was a particular issue that this um, occupancy survey showed is that 50% of the residents said that it was really too hot, too uncomfortable in summer and they really needed to keep their windows open at night to keep cool and of course it's on a busy roundabout so it's also the noisy traffic that then becomes an issue and this starts to show these interconnections between design that if we don't design um, already with future climate change in mind 
then actually some of the measures that occupants have to do could then really affect their quality of life, their health and well-being, or then they revert to using um, active cooling, which then in turn exacerbates um, a climate, the changing climate. So when they found out this data from the residents that um, there was so much overheating, they actually recorded additional data for August 2011 of the temperatures of the living room and bedroom. And what they basically found is that in the living room, um, the number of hours over 26 degrees was 98% of the time. And even one-fifth of the time, it was above 28 degrees, so it's very hot indeed. And it's even worse in the bedrooms, whereby it was 93% of the time in, in August 2011, above 25 degrees and above 23 degrees over uh, for 100% all of the time. So, of course, we like to have our bedrooms cooler because it's actually more pleasant uh, to sleep. So these are clear issues um, that require attention. And, of course, while these numbers are bad... Um, because it was monitored, it could actually be rectified and the architects could also learn from this. So they then did a follow-up study on, based on this data and they looked, as you can see on this graph here, they looked at different scenarios. This big high blue uh, band actually shows you the current situation and here on the right we see the timeline. So what this says is that in the current climate, we already have far too much overheating and it's only going to get worse over time with the predicted future climate change. The architects then looked uh, together with the engineers and how that basically uh, over time different measures can try to keep these, um, this overheating uh, to an acceptable level. And uh, so they basically then looked at uh, this, the second light blue one at optimal natural ventilation. So they could really open the windows very wide and they would open these when it was still cool outside. And that significantly reduces actually the overheating compared to the current situation where windows couldn't necessarily all open all the way. But of course, what was even more effective is by installing ceiling fans and uh, alongside the window, wide window ventilation. But then also um, what was even more effective, particularly when we look at um, the warming climate and later stages in the century, that it was also really changing the glazing specification to cut out some of that uh, overheating and solar gain uh, that was entering the spaces. So the conclusions of this from the architects was is that it's really important to think about how our buildings stay cool now and in the future. It was already a problem now and it was only going to get worse in the future. They also found that single aspect flats were a real problem. So those are the flats that only face one orientation, particularly then if that orientation is the south or west. Um, and they also calculated that to retrofit these measures like um, better windows, different glazing, ceiling fans and so on, would cost another one million pounds or about one million euros to retrofit for a 19 million pound scheme that would be needed. And of course, the lesson here is, is that if we can design today, already thinking ahead for the future, then actually it's much cheaper than needing this retrofit cost at a later stage. And the other lesson that they had is that we need to be really careful relying too much on mechanical systems, including the background ventilation. But the main lesson was night cooling, ventilation, ventilation, ventilation is so important to reduce overheating. But that, of course, does have implications for security, safety at night, particularly ground floor apartments or more vulnerable people. And also, of course, when it's in a, in a noisy city area as well. So in summary, I hope that these case studies, despite that they are several years old, but that they actually show that real housing design that is also in most cases affordable can also be sustainable and has in most cases shown to actually work quite well or where it wasn't, that they actually knew what it caused and could go and rectify these issues. Um, not always high standards and all values were applied. For example, community participation or future adaptability, biodiversity, eco-materials were not present in all of these three projects. And of course, when we're thinking holistically, they really should all be there. Um, there's also not many or examples where architects went back to check whether design works as intended, particularly also, also over time it would be good to get now more data to see if these projects continue to work really well in the changing climate, but also with a different and a diversity of users. And also, of course, since they've gone back and fixed things, 
uh, you know, it would be good to know if that still works so they can keep fixing things and learning for future projects. But I hope that the examples I've shown show the value of going back to see how buildings work and how integral that really is for us as architects to be able to design buildings that are truly sustainable and to understand also these interconnections between these different aspects of sustainability as well because that's when we collect data and it starts to reveal these issues as well. And I also hope that projects do not need to be aesthetically constrained, um, that they can still be of high quality even if they are actually designed to high quality standards. So how can we build on these examples and enhance our design approaches? Well, I hope we can look and discuss it in part three, where we can overcome challenges together. So I look forward to meeting you then. Thank you very much.